Well, welcome back. It's time for us to shift gears in the class a little bit and move forward into taping. You might think that taping is something that's a thing of the past, but to be real honest, uh, it's still a foundational skill and there's more to it than meets the eye. So my purpose here is to not make you experts in everything there is to know about taping, but to make sure that you know enough about all of the factors involved to keep you from looking foolish in the field uh, should you need to be in the field or even in in uh, professional practice dealing with folks who work in the field so uh, taping is an essential part of what we do and uh, we want to make sure that you understand proper applications of it and uh, proper proper procedures and the corrections that we have to apply We'll spend a little time talking about the history that led, has led us up to where we are today. Let's talk a little bit about distance units. Uh, if you've been around the agricultural world and uh, considered legal descriptions of land, you may have seen the term rods show up. You, know, it may, you may have a legal description that says it's the north northeast quarter of the northeast quarter of section so-and-so except the east four rods thereof for the east ten rods or perhaps a land description that is said it's the the north ten rods of the north of the east twenty rods of a particular tract well a rod is a historic unit that we get from england that is that unit is sixteen and a half feet long as this was used in England as early as 1066, and the Saxons um, during that period referred to it as a rod or a gird. We don't see hear the term gird very much anymore, but you will hear rod and pole, a Norman name, used interchangeably. Occasionally you'll see it referred to as a perch. Now, Measuring with a measuring with a sixteen and a half foot long wood rod is not the most practical thing, especially in hilly terrain. If we're trying to measure horizontal distances, uh, a rigid rod makes it difficult. However, if we want to have something a little more um, adaptable to terrain in various various situations, we, uh, back then uh, there was a need for a gunter's chain, and the gunter's chain was developed by a fellow named Edmund Gunter, another Englishman, in 1620. Edmund Gunter was a, uh, oh, one of these jack-of-all-trade types, a, a philosopher, a mathematician, a scientist, and, uh, and an inventor. Well, the Gunter's chain uh, was commonly used, once it took hold, from about 1700 into the early 1900s commonly used in obviously in England but uh, n most notably for us here in the United States. The Gunter's chain is intended to be four rods long, uh, 66 feet. In fact that 66 feet or 16 and a half times four is divided into 100 lengths. So really yes it's 66 feet long but it's, it's a decimal device that is it's divided into 100 parts. Here is a view of a Gunter's chain laid out in a serpentine fashion and every one of the the long wire links here, the straight portion with a loop on each end, every one of those is considered one link. If it's 66 feet long and there are a hundred links, then each link is 0.66 feet long or just pretty much right at eight inches so two-thirds of a foot notice there are some tags that are attached to the each tenth link so near the bottom of the picture uh, you see tags that have a single point well those tags uh, that I'm indicating here uh, are one set of ten links or they are ten links from each end these next tags have two points, thus each one is 20 links from the end. This has three points, 30 links. This is four points or 40 links, 
And the one in the middle is actually kind of a round tag. You can't see it very well in this particular image, but we call that the ball tag, and it is 50 links from each end. So really this is a double-ended chain. In that day and age, uh, the surveyor commonly measured to the nearest link, rounded to the nearest link. That's not near as uh, precisely as we try to measure these days. So yes, there was some significant rounding error in all of this the handles at the ends of the chain that you see down here at the bottom of the image are designed such that the from the middle of the, the first joint link joint uh, down to the end of the chain from there to the end of the handle was designed to be one link so end to, end of handle to end of handle was 66 feet the mile as we know it is based on the length of the chain. That is, uh, uh, in the 1700s and eight, 1800s, the ch mile was considered to be 80 chains, more so than it was considered to be 5,280 feet. So people thought of a half miles being 40 chains, and a quarter being 20, an eighth being 10. And perhaps you've heard that term, term a furlong. Uh, I believe this relates to the horse racing world, well, that's 10 chains, or 660 feet. The public land survey system that we have here in um, the former Northwest Territories and the Louisiana Purchase, um, uh, that public land survey system is based on the 66-foot chain. Uh, this particular aerial photo shows Parkland College over here at the extreme upper right and the the land out here to the west of Parkland and Champaign you can see divided into one mile by one mile sections well each of those sections was intended to be 80 chains long now there are some errors that accumulate in all of this but uh, that's a subject for boundary survey much later in the semester. This <clears throat> public land survey system was built on the standard township. And a township, uh, as originally uh, developed, is a six mile by six mile uh, grid of one square mile sections. And each township is divided into those 36 sections and those sections are numbered in the pattern that you see here in a serpentine fashion starting in the northeast corner running to the west and then serpentine back and forth all the way across the township down to section 36 in the southeast corner. Lines across the south end of each township were considered township lines south and north the lines on the east and west sides of the township were called range lines. And we'll go more into that when we talk about boundary surveys in the end of the semester. If a square mile is 80 chains by 80 chains, then one square mile is 6,400 square chains. That makes sense. 80 times 80 is 6,400. Well, we didn't we don't think in terms of area and square chains, we think of area in terms of acres. And an acre is defined as 10 square chains, or one chain by 10 chains. Well, if that's the case, then we divide our 6,400 square chains by 10 square chains per acre, and we get one square mile is 640 acres. So if we take this section, a standard section that is one mile by one mile, and we divide it uh, into, as we call it, aliquot parts. Aliquot is spelled A-L-I-Q-U-O-T. And we'll, again, discuss this when we get into boundary surveys. If we divide it into appropriate aliquot parts, we're going to divide it down into fractions, uh, regular fractions. So that northwest quarter that you see here in the section is literally one quarter of the acreage or or uh, 160 acres thus uh, it is 40 chains on the north side and 40 chains on the west side so 100 or 1600 square chains divided by 10 chains for uh, 
10 square chains per acre, gives us 160 acres. I think then you can see that the, the northeast quarter of this northeast quarter up here, where my cursor is, is 20 chains, right? 20 chains, or 400 square chains, thus 40 acres. So if you're curious about how big 40 acres is, well, 20 chains by 20 chains gives you one quarter mile by one quarter mile. Now there's a problem with the Gunter's chain. As, as is true for any metallic chain, if you drag it through the dirt long enough, the abrasive soil that gets between the links rubs away some of the metal. And as the metal rubs away, the chain actually gets longer. Well, that induces a systematic error in every measurement. The chain stretched due to abrasion in the links, and that systematic error required correction. Thus, uh, surveyors who were laying out section and range line, or township and range lines, and ultimately sections for the government land office in the 1800s were required to keep um, a chain that was not used on a daily basis as a standard against which to compare their daily chain to see the scope of their systematic error and thus they had to correct their distances. We still feel this impact today in boundary surveys because remember uh, if they were measuring to the nearest link and their chain was known to be say half a link too long well then Perhaps they did, perhaps they didn't account for that standard error because, well, if they're measuring the nearest link, why would they want to correct uh, a distance if the error is smaller than the smallest rounding unit they apply? So as a result, if we measure between two corners of a section, almost never will we get exactly 5,280 feet. It will often be longer, but there are many cases where it can and should be shorter. The Gunter's chain was made obsolete by the steel tape in about the early 1900s. Why did we have the Gunter's chain in the first place? Well, we didn't have the technology to make spring steel tapes in the 16, 17, and 1800s. So as steel alloying advanced to the point of making successful spring steel tapes, when that happened, the Gunter's chain started falling by the wayside. And we were able to use tapes much like um, you have seen in uh, perhaps you have seen in the surveying lab, or will see as a part of this course. These days we have multiple tools that we use to measure distance with. One is a six-foot wood ruler that, uh, uh, again, if you have not seen one, you will see one soon. Simply a folding wood ruler graduated in inches on one side and tenths and hundredths on the other side. Very useful tool, very basic, but uh, it measures things that we don't necessarily need higher tech for. A fiberglass cloth tape is one that uh, can take a good bit more abuse than perhaps a steel tape can take, and lower cost, but because it is a fabric tape, it can stretch. A steel tape can be made to stretch as well, however, uh, it takes significantly more force to do so, and uh, it tends to be more dimensionally stable. With the steel tape, we can also predict the systematic error caused by expansion and contraction due to temperature. Often these days, we'll use a, a visible laser for measuring from wall to wall inside a structure. Or we may have a laser mounted in part of a total station to measure distance to points not accessible with a prism. Now we use prisms with electronic distance meters that rely on infrared light. An electronic distance meter is, uh, is a component of today's total station instruments. In the surveying lab here at Parkland, I encourage you to take a look in the display case back by the storage cabinets for the survey equipment and across the bottom you will see uh, three, uh, three instruments, two of which are uh, solely distance meters, a very large gray instrument called a uh, geodometer model 6A that dates back into the 60s and all it did was measure distance. Then there was another yellow box type attachment atop a, a green uh, theodolite 
and that yellow box is also a distance meter. It accomplishes the same thing as the big gray instrument. And then there's a gray total station. It's a Sokia Set 3, I believe, is the model. And it has the distance meter built in. You'll be using total stations with distance meters here in just a few short weeks. Now, as we move forward, we need to talk about steel taping errors. You're going to be doing a little bit of steel taping very soon, and that's going to require not only proper field procedures to minimize random and systematic errors, but it's also going to require that you do correct for some of those systematic errors. And so let's give you a list of what those are, and then we're going to limit our discussion and our applications to just one of those. First of all, temperature is probably the, the most obvious to you. You know that, that steel or really any metals will contract and expand with changes in temperature. Tension and sag are also error sources. That is, if you pull a 100 foot tape across some opening, um, maybe it's an excavation, and that tape is not supported along its length, well, it will sag, uh, be, just like any suspended wire between power poles. It will have some kind of sag. Well, you can reduce that sag by pulling harder on each end. But even then, it would be enormously difficult uh, with humans to pull all the sag out of the tape. Ultimately, there is a point at which stretch in the tape due to tension will counteract the effects of sag and the errors cancel out. These errors are typically small enough for our purposes that with good procedure in the field we can uh, uh, we do not need to make any correction for these issues from normal conditions. Slope is an issue as well. If you are taping down the slope with the tape on the ground, down a slope on the ground, you're going to need to correct that for, for slope to convert it to a horizontal distance. You, I think, understand that on a plan view, that is a map of a site, we cannot plot a slope distance. We can only plot a horizontal distance because the vertical component of any slope distance gets eliminated in the two-dimensional view of a map. So we have to correct for slope. Or we must ensure that we do all our taping in the horizontal plane. Alignment is another issue too. If our, if we need to tape uh, a distance of 500 feet, we want our tape, our 100 foot tape laid down five times to follow as close to possible a, a true straight line between our beginning and end points. If our tape wanders a few feet away from the most direct route, then that alignment, or misalignment in this case, induces an error in our measurement. We'll actually measure longer than the actual distance. Marking is an issue. Perhaps you've heard the, the uh, facetious uh, adage that says we're going to measure with a micrometer, we're going to mark with chalk, we're going to cut with an axe, and we're going to you know, paint to blend. Well, the idea there is you may start with the best of intentions, but the, if your methods become more crude along the way, you lose the accuracy that you intended when you started. So when we mark, if we're trying to measure to the nearest hundredth of a foot, then we want to make sure that our mark is, is more finely divided than our smallest increment on our measuring device. So it's very important that we mark carefully and accurately. Tape length is less of an error than it used to be, but in previous days, because of the cost of the steel tapes we use, if a tape got broken due to kinking or other reasons, we would commonly splice it. Well, it's difficult to splice it without inducing some permanent error in the tape. This is not so much an issue anymore because most of the people, most people in our current environment, if they break a tape, it's not a, a steel tape, it's not a very common occurrence, and 
they'll replace it instead of repairing it. But I know many people that have repaired tapes in the past, but if you tried to repair one now, you'd have a hard time finding the appropriate supplies to make that happen. So tape length is more of an issue of the past than it is of the present. Now, what's the impact of all of these on taping? We are shooting for uh, a target accuracy of one foot uh, error for every 5,000 feet of measurement, so or or one part error for 5,000 parts measurement. Doesn't matter what unit, as long as you see that it's a dimensionless one over 5,000 ratio. So in order to get there, we have some criteria we need to apply for every 100 foot tape length. So that means uh, we want to apply these standards in order to reach 1 in 5,000 accuracy. So to reach 1 in 5,000 we need to know our temperature to the nearest 7 degrees Fahrenheit. That will give us a maximum of plus or minus one half of a hundredth of a foot. We need to apply at least normal tension uh, and we need to know that within five pounds. Normal tension is that tension in which the effects of sag and tension cancel each other out. This is going to be in the 10 to 15 pound range for many tapes. If we know that to within five pounds, you can often get this by estimating, then you're going to be uh, an error, induce an error of about six thousandths or six tenths of a hundredth of a foot. We need to ensure that our slope errors are no more than about one foot in a hundred feet. That is, the elevation of one end of the tape is no higher or lower than one one foot uh, from the other end of the tape. Again, this gives us about a half a hundredth error. If we keep the tape in line between our beginning and destination points, to within a half a foot for every 100 foot tape length, then we're only going to induce 1,000th of a foot error, plus or minus. If we mark, uh, make marks and we use a plumb bob correctly so that our maximum marking error is about a hundredth and a half, then indeed we have a plus or minus hundredth and a half error in a 100 foot tape length. We need to know the length of our tape to within uh, a half of a hundredth. Uh, again, this is an issue less now than it was in the past. But if I take all of these error sources and I apply an error of a sum uh, analysis to them, as you would see in chapter three of your text, then we can, you can see that uh, this gives us an estimated error of 0 0.018 feet. So when I, that's almost two hundredths of a foot in a 100 foot tape length. So that means if I measure something twice and it comes out at say 100 on the first try and 100.02 then what I have is accuracy very close to uh, what we've got given here. If I use 0.018, I'm going to get uh, 1 in 5400 is my error ratio. Well, if I degrade that to 1 in 5000, then my allowable error is 2 hundredths of a foot for every 100 feet of measurement. You'll find that with good field skills, this is a very attainable standard. But as we have said, as our technology has evolved, we do less taping now than we used to. It is still a very viable tool for certain types of construction layout checks. Now, the steel tape itself, when we talk about the tape length, that is considered certified at standard conditions at the manufacturer. So the manufacturer will take a brand new 100 foot tape and stretch it out on a long table in a room that is held at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And they will apply to this tape 10 pounds of tension and they will ensure that the tape is fully supported along its length. In these conditions, if the tape is 
exactly 100.00 feet long, then it is it is a certified tape. And typically these days, uh, if you buy a tape that has um, these standard conditions stamped on it, then it is certified. I have never known of anybody buying an uncertified tape. Okay, the the error source that we're going to spend the majority of our time on is uh, temperature correction for steel tapes. This information is in your text as well, but I've given you uh, a formula expressing this in English units. I'm not going to bother with metric. Uh, the process is the same. The units are different. And at this point, you know how to convert back and forth. But I will say this. Um, the constant that you see there, 0 0.00006465, that coefficient of linear expansion is fixed. It is fixed. So you need to uh, use that um, consistently when you're in uh, an English-based system. For a metric, uh, metric correction, it's a different factor. T, of course, is the temperature at the time of measurement, and L is the distance we measure. So if you use 100 feet, 100 foot tape, and you lay it down 12 times, to measure 1207.14, then the distance you put in for L is 1207.14. That is if you want to correct the entire distance. It's important to notice that this correction can be positive or negative. For instance, if you look at the term in parentheses, you can see that for a value of T greater than 68, then the the term in parentheses will be a positive value. But if t is less than 68, then you'll have a, a value in parentheses that is negative. Thus, in that case, the correction will be negative. Well, we have two situations with which we can apply these corrections. Number one is a scenario in which we're measuring between two existing points. The second scenario is one in which we're laying out a new distance. That is, we have one point established, and we need to create a new point at the specified distance away from the new point, or the existing point. So note that in the first scenario, to convert a measured distance to an actual distance, we have to apply a correction factor. So if I measure 1,200 feet uh, and my temperature is 95 degrees, well, then I'm going to have a positive correction. And I will add that correction to my measured distance to get an actual distance. Now, this is a good time to... Um, have you make some make some notes here and these are well these are simple little adages I think you'll find useful first of all when a tape gets hot when it's greater than 68 degrees when the tape gets hot it gets longer correct so if the tape gets longer then the reading on your tape will be short. When the tape is longer, the reading on your tape is short. And when your tape is short, because it's cold, the reading on your tape is longer than reality. It's going to be very important to apply this in the lab, especially when you go to do corrections. So a hot tape is long and it reads short. A cold tape is short and it reads long. Thus, when we go to lay out a new distance, and we want to lay it out at the appropriate distance, but we are using a tape that we know to be either cold or hot, then in order to produce the actual distance on the ground, we have to figure out what we must measure with the tape. 
You see, what we measure with the tape will read differently than what we actually want to mark. So we solve the top equation for the bottom, to create the bottom one. Instead of finding out what our actual distance is between two points, we solve that same relationship for measured distance. We'll take the actual distance we want to create and subtract our correction, whether that be positive or negative, and thus we get our distance that we must measure to create the actual distance. So if I am, if I am subtracting a minus, a negative correction, then I have a net addition. If I'm subtracting a positive correction, I have a net subtraction. So, here's something I want you to consider. If I have two existing points, I've measured them to be 100 feet apart on an 83 degree Fahrenheit day. Can we find the actual distance? Well, how would we do it? Let's back up and look at the formula. Here you can see our inputs will be T and L. T will have a value of 83 and L will have a, a value of 100.00. So our temperature change is 15 degrees and our total length is 100 Point zero zero, and we apply both of these to our coefficient for linear expansion and your result will round to a positive 0 0.01 or one hundredth of a foot. Well that's significant because it gives us a nice rule of thumb. You see a 15 degree Fahrenheit temperature change whether you're going up or down, it produces a one hundredth of a foot length change in a one hundred foot steel tape. So if we went up to 83 degrees on a one hundred foot tape, then we have a one hundred a one hundredth of a foot change in that tape. If we go down to 53 degrees, then instead of having a positive 0.01 foot length change, we have a negative 0.01 foot. If I'm going 300 feet on that 83 degree day, then my total correction is a positive 0.03. I think you can see how we can use this for simple and quick estimating. So I encourage you to take a look at some temperature correction examples. Remember, you have two scenarios. You are either measuring between two existing points or you are laying out uh, a new point from an existing one. I've given these to you in your handout and I encourage you to practice with these um, while you have a chance. Again, uh, two existing point problems here and then I've got a few layout problems for you as well. As part of our map taping and mapping lab, our intent is to give you some basic hands-on in steel taping processes. We're not going to make you an expert, but give you a familiarity with proper field methods. We're going to use that as the groundwork to move forward from taping into basic mapping. And the basic mapping I would like to address is related to something you've already seen a little bit of. But first, let's talk about the multiple methods available for mapping. One perhaps you have heard of or seen is a grid method. One of the most visible versions of this that the public is aware of is you might have seen it on some kind of Discovery Channel or History Channel or um, PBS kind of show in which you have archaeologists or scuba divers that have have a, a grid of of strings or, or lines crossing a particular site and as they dig things up they they make a, a map of the location of every artifact relative to that grid. We could do something similar in in uh, engineering surveying 
except instead of stretching strings, we we may we may estimate the grid and take elevation measurements on that grid. Another one that you will use is when you learn the basics of total station operations is radial measurement. With an instrument sitting up in one place, you'll simply turn angles to um, uh, your, your targets and then take elevation and distance measurements at those targets. You can plot this information using a simple protractor and a scale and paper. What we're going to do uh, initially is a station and offset method. Just as you have seen stationing applied to roadways, well we can apply it to a lot of different things. So we will establish a baseline and from that baseline measure offsets left and right of the baseline to create horizontal positions that we can plot on a drawing and then at each location we can make elevation measurements. Now this this may seem obvious, but it's worth stating. Our field measurement methods must give results that can be plotted on a map. Therefore, in the field, the survey party chief has the has the responsibility to ensure collection of enough information sufficient for someone else to draw a map solely from the notes. Now these days with radial measurement techniques we're often generating maps without putting pen to paper very much at all. We're using electronic data collection methods which does a lot of this for us. It converts radial measurements into positions on a coordinate grid uh, with positions marked with a northing and easting and an elevation or an X and a Y and a Z. Uh, regardless of what we do our field measurement method must be compatible with our map creation method, the way we plot the map. So we're going to start out with methods that you can plot by hand. So let's talk about station and offset. We've alluded to it a little bit already in this in this class, but uh, let me give you some examples to uh, help you understand it just a little bit better. I have a drawing for you here that shows uh, uh, a center line that you can see running up and down the middle of the drawing and then on this uh, map there is a building that's shaded gray and there are some tree symbols that indicate some trees. There is some pavement and a parking lot that, that runs from the left side of the drawing over toward the building and it looks like we have some overhead electric lines and little symbols at locations like 1, 2, 3, and 4 to indicate the, the poles that those lines are on. Well, the, the center line of this is of this site, or the baseline, is the backbone upon which we will make all our measurements. Now, the direction of the increasing station goes from the top of the image to the bottom. And the direction of increasing station has everything to do with what is considered a right offset and what is considered a left offset. So if you are standing on that center line looking in the direction of increasing station, right would be on your right and left would be on your left. So in this case, if you were standing at the top of the drawing looking toward the bottom, right and left are as they are labeled. However, if you were standing at the bottom of the drawing, say station 17 plus 00, looking toward 12 plus 00, then the left on the site is at your right hand and vice versa. Now if we want to start collecting station and offset data, we have to remember which direction the, the station stationing runs in. Depending on your accuracy needs, you may round to the nearest foot or the nearest tenth of a foot. And I think a lot of these examples are rounded to the nearest foot or two or maybe even the nearest five feet. But position two here has an approximate position of 11 plus 40 and 105 feet right simply meaning 11 plus 40 is 
40 feet past station 11 plus 00, zero which is not shown here or it is 60 feet before station 12 plus 00. zero. 105 feet right indicates that measured perpendicular to the baseline uh, object 2 which is a power pole is 105 feet to the right at right angles from the baseline. Multiple points can have the same station. In fact here uh, it appears that our overhead electric line must be running perpendicular to the baseline. So the same station occurs at point 1 and it is at 220 feet right. Uh, on the left side of the baseline, item 3, another power pole, appears at 12 plus 65, 42 feet left. And then if we work our way around this building, you'll find that, um, again, express to the nearest 5 feet, which perhaps is not near so good as what you need, but illustrative of uh, this particular example. You'll find that point 0.5 falls at 13 plus 30. That is 30 feet pa past 13 plus 0, 0, and that corner is 155 feet left of the center line. Here is 14 plus 0, 0, 110 foot left. Uh, point 0.8 shows at 14 plus 0, 0.5 at 250 foot left, and then point 0.7 shows at 14 plus 75 at 205 feet left. So these are some simple examples of how we are going to put station and offset to use. As a part of our lab procedures here, our goal is to have you mapping existing features having established a baseline. Once you have located every feature that you want to appear on your drawing using station and offset, then the simple hand plotting process on a sheet of paper will be to draw the baseline, station it, and then relative to that station baseline, plot your offset points. Once they are plotted, you could connect the dots in a, in a drawing much like you see here. And then, uh, using elevation data you have collected at each plotted point, you could plot that elevation on your drawing and thus start to do basic engineering design. I have used this method in multiple places. In fact, one of the more memorable ones was, um, well, two memorable ones. Over at the intersection of 4th and Green, right next to, just to the east of the new high-rise building there, there is a two-story, maybe a three-story brick building right on the corner. Um, I think it's got a couple of little eateries and maybe a hair shop in it. I had to do a, a topographic survey of that site right before that uh, high-rise went up. And it was simpler and quicker, more economical for us to do the mapping using baselines and offsets in simple leveling. Uh, probably the other most memorable one is was inside the fence at the medium max security prison over at Danville. There, because of the, um, the, the risks associated, the Department of Corrections did not want us to bring in anything expensive. So we had to take in the most basic of tools. Fortunately, they were small sites within the compound where they were going to be building security walls and security fences and needed simple maps for the design of those. So I carried in through the, through the multiple gates an automatic level and legs and a rod and a cloth tape, a field book, a calculator, a mechanical pencil, and a six-foot ruler. And I spent all day making maps using these very methods. These are simple methods, very reliable, very basic, and you, uh, if you do any field work at all uh, doing surveying, there is a, a pretty good chance that you may need to employ these methods at some time. We employ them as part of our labs here in this course, and hopefully this discussion has uh, prepared you well for that.